Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, released in 2009 as a sequel to his 2007 remake. Originally, Rob Zombie didn't want to do this movie, saying he was too exhausted for making the first one, but he eventually agreed to it, not only because of, you know, money, but also because producer Malik Akkad told him they were taking the reins off. Now he could make a Rob Zombie Halloween movie as Rob Zombie-ish as he wanted to. And that's why this movie is much closer stylistically to Zombie's other films than his first Halloween even if the content is largely the same. That is, a behemoth Michael Myers brutally murdering lots of people, including several naked chicks. And when I say these murders are brutal, I mean it. For my money, this is the single goriest movie in the franchise, which is why I had to leave out some of the most explicit shots or else YouTube would slap me with an age restriction. However, there is an uncut version of this kill count available on my Patreon for any and all supporters. And don't get upset about that, man. We did the same thing for Saw and it worked out just fine. Shot on 16mm film to give it that extra grindhouse grain, this movie at first first may just seem like a grungy remake of the original Halloween 2 from 1981, the one set in a hospital, but it quickly becomes its own movie that explores more of Michael's backstory as well as how Laurie and Dr. Loomis are recovering from the events of the first film. Once again, there are two different versions of this movie, and once again, I'll be using the theatrical one for the kill count. You know the drill by now, though. Tomorrow, we'll have a cut comparison looking at the differences. In the meantime, let's get to the kills. The movie begins at the Smiths Grove Santa Terrium. Get it? Santa? Because it's Christmas time? Deborah Myers is here to give a white horse uh, statue or something to her son Michael, now played by a different grungy little kid. Original actor Dag Fairch had just gotten too big since they made the first movie. Not in like a famous kind of way, he was just like really tall. Michael tells her about a dream he had where Deborah was dressed all in white. Like a ghost. Like a really beautiful ghost. And in that ghostly dream, she had a white horse that looked just like this toy. Hope all that sounds super interesting to you, because we'll be coming back to it a lot. After that cold open, we're 15 years later again, picking up immediately after the ending of the first movie. Scout Taylor Strode is walking through the streets, covered in blood and carrying a gun, until Sheriff Brackett is able to catch up with her and try to calm her down. She's taken to a hospital, where she very fearfully asks if she's gonna make it. Damn, that's intense. Looks like she's not gonna die, but in order to save her, the doctors, led by Caroline Williams, are gonna have to perform a whole bevy of medi stuff, which is of course all done in real graphic close-ups. Meanwhile, Sheriff Brackett is cleaning up the crime scene, which includes getting the still-living Loomis into an ambulance and taking care of the corpses. When it comes to Michael, they strap him to a gurney and put him in a van that's driven by coroners Alan Hooks and Gary Scott. Looks like Gary graduated from the Axel Academy of Coroner Creepery. Did you get a look at the naked chick? She still look good to me. Nice old titties are hanging out, huh? Ah, oh, what the? There's always one, you know? What's the difference between jam and jelly? What? You can't jelly your cock up a dead girl's ass. <laughs> or I guess two, if we're in a Rob Zombie movie. We need these two dudes to die, and since Michael still passed out, it's gonna take some bovine intervention. Cow! No! Holy cow, what a crash! It fucks the van up good and kills Hooks in the process, and the movie milks his death for all it's worth. That is one crushed effing skull, dude. Gary is also seriously messed up from the crash. In fact, it seems to have knocked his entire vocabulary unconscious, except for a single word. Fuck! 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 He's gonna fuck, fuck, fuck some more after he finds out Michael frickin' Myers lived through that cow crash just fine. Still wearing his mask, he grabs a piece of glass from the wreckage and calmly walks over to the passenger seat of the van, where he uses it to not only slit Gary's throat, but actually saw his head off entirely. If you didn't believe me about this being the goriest Halloween, it's not my fault. I tried to give you a heads up. But Michael loses interest in this noggin when he sees a vision of a white horse and his dead mom standing in the middle of the road. All these dreams and visions of white ponies? Maybe Michael's just a huge Deftones fan. In the hospital, Lori gets herself out of bed and finds Annie on life support in another room. She wants to stay with her stitched up friend, but Nurse Daniels, played by Academy Award winner Octavia Spencer, insists that she go back to her own room for rest. Nurse Daniels is called away on the PA, but she doesn't stay a hidden figure for long. She reappears shortly with a real nasty looking face slash that could only have been done by the shape of slaughter. Lori gets the hell out of there as Michael comes around the corner, and he's not here to give Nurse Daniels the help. Instead, he slowly walks over to her and kills her in a brutal manner by aggressively stabbing her in the back at least 10 times. Damn, dude, I don't think she's gonna be able to get on up after that one. As Lori tries to escape, she comes across another kill to add to the count, this uh, nurse lady, I think, who's missing her eyeballs and whose body is doubling as an obstacle to slow Lori down. She's able to get around her all right, though, so you know what? Next time, try a little harder with your body barriers, Mikey. We're in the midst of a standard Halloween chase scene now, complete with recreated shots from the original Halloween 2, until Lori winds up outside and Michael winds up 
with a free axe for the taking. Smashy smashy! Lori makes her way through the rain to a little security booth that she gets inside of and hides in, as Michael comes outside to get drenched in the downpour as well. God, he's gotta smell something awful by now. This smelly mountain man gets another victim for the taking when Buddy the Night Watchman shows up, played by Swamp Tour enthusiast Richard Ryle. He finds Lori and tells her everything is going to be okay, but I wouldn't jump to conclusions like that, bud, because after he pulls the car up to the booth, Michael appears and hacks him in the back. Damn it, Michael, I know his job seemed a little unnecessary, but he had people skills. He was good at dealing with people. What the hell is wrong with you, Michael? It doesn't take long for Michael to huff and puff and ax this booth down so he can get to Lori, but when he gets inside and goes for an overhead swing on her, she wakes up screaming in bed? Wait, what? How much of that was just a dream? Probably just the hospital scene, though I'ma still count those kills, cause they were real enough for Lori, who one year later is still having to remind herself that she's safe now. He's fucking dead. Should we tell her now or wait? Wait? Yeah, let's wait. Nowadays, Lori is living with the Brackets, which is great since it's an excuse to have more Danielle Harris and Brad Dorif. Their extra screen time in the sequel is definitely one of the movie's highlights. Lori's emotional recovery from the previous year is helped along by her therapist Barbara Collier, played by Kill Count veteran and all-around kick-ass lady Margot Kidder. Rest in peace. Lori's also trying to get by with a little help from her friends. New friends, since, you know, a lot of her old ones were murdered. These new future victims work at a music store with Lori. There's caring and considerate Maya and raunchy party girl Harley. They're three great friends. See how they rock? Speaking of rock, let's meet back up with Dr. Sam Loomis, who at this point is acting like a rock star with a no brown M&M's rider. Well, I'm not going in there until you go get me a cup of PG tips with a splash of milk, and I want it sizzling hot. He gives a lecture to promote his new book about the events in the previous film, but after he gets a cue asking if Michael Myers might still be alive, he explodes in a fit of rage swearing that it's impossible, even though some scenes intercut with this show that Mountain Man Myers is indeed still alive, and walking through a, uh, field right now? Oh fuck, we're back to that ghost mom shit? Come on! What are we doing here? Michael. Halloween is coming. You have to get ready. Ah, oh, this is getting out of hand. Now there are two of him. Michael is found walking around that field by more beloved character actors, namely Mark Boone Jr. playing a dude named Floyd and Pulp Fiction's Dwayne Whitaker playing Floyd's son-in-law Sherman. They own these here fields and don't like trespassers on them, so they take a crowbar and a bat and beat the crap out of Michael. Damn. It might be the only moment in this movie I actually feel bad for Mikey. Floyd's daughter Jasmine, played by Betsy Rue of My Bloody Valentine 3D, also feels bad for Mikey and stops the beatdown from continuing, but the damage is done and Michael is frickin' pissed. Like, put that Shatner mask back on kinda pissed. He kills the two men in quick succession. First Sherman gets a knife slit across the eyes, and then Michael turns his attention to Floyd, who starts off with a knife in the belly. Michael then impales Floyd onto the deer antlers decorating the hood of his vehicle, and then goes back to finish off Sherman with his trademark super series of stabbings. Damn guys, you should have brought out the gimp for backup. At this point, Michael is growling like an animal, and even though Jazlian was good to you, Mikey, that doesn't stop him from dragging dragging her out of the truck and killing her. <laughs> Wow, Michael, are you out of shape? Cause that was a grunt. A deep inhalation of oxygen to aid in the stretching of muscles. I know what that sound signifies. There's also a dog in the truck, but thankfully the movie cuts away before we see what happens to it. Just kidding, Michael murders that poor pup. But I'll be nice and not show you the part where he stabs and then eats it. Yeah, Michael eats that dog, but don't act so surprised he's been doing that shit since the first movie. What is that? It's a dog. He got hungry. This time it's extra nasty though. Not only because it's on screen, but also because it's intercut with family dinner time at the Bracken house for extra gross out points. Eating dog is enough to trigger a music video sequence, I guess, so here's some more multiple Michaels and their black and white dead mom. Oh, and look, a spoopy Michael Myers skeleton? What the fuck, man? Did someone put Krampus and a razor head in a blender? Cause that's what this shit feels like. New little boy Michael tells his ghost mom that he's found his baby sister. My baby. And then some hands pop out of a table and Lori wakes up from this festival production. Ladies and gentlemen, Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. It's the day before Halloween now, and Michael Myers just walks straight through a road sign to get to Haddonfield, Illinois. Wonder if he's headed to his old home, which Dr. Loomis is currently using as a backdrop for an interview, despite his publicist taking issues with it. I'm selling the sizzle not the steak. Man, Loomis has become such a dick. And not even the fun kind, it's just uncomfortable now. When I want your opinion, I'll beat it out of you. Whoa, look, I'm down with fame-seeking Loomis, but maybe pump the brakes for a mo there, huh? While Loomis is actively making us dislike him, Lori is reluctantly becoming less pleasant, cause now she's having a dream-slash-fantasy sequence of duct-taping Annie to a chair like Michael did to Ronnie and slitting her throat with a knife. The movie once again veers into crazy, flashy music video territory. Are you fucking dead? 
that ends with a saw-looking fast-speed shot of Lori in a coffin. For anyone who wanted Rob Zombie's Halloween to have more of his style in it, here you go. Are you happy now? At Rabbit and Red, the strip joint that once showcased Deborah Myers' talents, owner Big Lou has dancer Misty Dawn grind against his lap as he tells his hapless employee Howard to take out the trash. After recklessly flipping a cigarette near that gas tank, what the fuck, man? Howard goes to the dumpster where Michael Myers steps out and silently confronts him. Howard tries to act tough, but come on, dude, you're looking at the human form of Chernabog. What you about to do here? Get fucking choke slammed, apparently, which knocks his ass down so Michael can kill him by just stomping the shit out of his skull. Back inside, Lou is getting ready to bang Misty Dawn while dressed as Frankenstein's monster. But the role playing quickly ends after Michael walks into the office. Although Big Lou gets out a small gun, it doesn't deter Michael from walking up and landing another choke slam. Misty flees the room as Lou gets a severe beatdown from Michael. He stumbles out of his office with a broken arm, and after bouncing around the walls a little bit, Michael bashes his head once more and he collapses to the undoubtedly filthy floor to die. Misty's by herself now, and you can call me an SJW if you want to be a dick about it, but I'm sick of Rob Zombie's Michael Myers murdering completely nude ladies all the time. It's gratuitous, it usually sucks for the actress, and it gives me a ton more work to do since I've got to censor all the naughty bits. But naked Misty is killed by repeated head slams into a mirror that leaves her a naked corpse. Great, let's get to Halloween already. On the big day in Haddonfield, Brackett reads through Loomis's book and gets real pissed about some of the pros. Geez, sorry if it's not Shakespeare, Brackett. He's actually pissed because Loomis chose to reveal the big Meyer sibling secret in his latest book, The Devil Walks Among Us, which is fixing to be a big hit, judging by that line wrapped around the corner. Loomis is having a blast at the book signing until he gets an angry patron in the form of Mr. Vanderklot, the father of Linda, who was killed in the last movie. Remember her? She was the naked chick Michael killed. No, not the first one, the, uh... Well, one of them anyway. The dude even tries to shoot Loomis before he gets ushered out by security. Damn, Loomis, you've made yourself some enemies in this timeline. And he doesn't do a good job making more friends when he promotes the book on a talk show hosted by Chris Hardwick. Cause, Sam, you just can't be that formal with Weird Al. Mr. Weird. How are you? Al's good. Please, Mr. Weird is my father. Lori discovers her relation to Michael from the book and has a meltdown in a parking lot that continues while she's driving later that night. <laughs> She heads over to Maya's house because, oh yeah, she's a character we kind of met before, and does a very poor job explaining the situation. I don't mean you understand what the fuck I'm saying. No, I do not. But she clarifies for her friends that she's Angel Myers, Michael's baby sister, and that it's all in Loomis's book for everyone to see. In response, Lori's looking to get fucked up and be a woo girl all night. And although Maya thinks that Lori just needs a mellow night in, Lori gets Haley on her side, and the two of them convince Maya to join them for their Rocky Horror costumes at this bitchin' Halloween party. Looks like a great time, full of festive drinks and creepy clowns and more naked ladies. What a shocker. At least that Psycho Billy music's pretty dope. Frank and Harley leaves the party with a wolf man and goes to a shaggin' wagon, so you know these two ain't long for this world. Damn, this dude's gonna try to bang Harley with his mask still on? Wolfman's got nards. Before they round another base, he steps outside to pee, and while he's out there, Michael attacks him and kills him with a single stab to the back. Pretty uncharacteristic of this Michael to not follow that stab up with like a dozen more, but I guess he sees the runtime and realizes he's gotta get a move on here. He busts through the van to keep things going, then grabs Harley and chokes her to death, squeezing the life out of her as the scene intercuts with her oblivious friends dancing. They've got a rose tinted world right now, but sadly, Harley's not safe from the trouble and pain. Lori ends up so drunk that she loses track of Maya as well, in yet another stylized sequence that turns into a Sherry Moon Zombie music video again. Dead Deborah tells Lori that it's almost time for her to come home, and then she gets attacked by Michael. But it turns out she was just having a freak out next to a big ol' stuffed bear. Maya finds Lori doing the Ursin grind and yanks her out of the party to head back home. Meanwhile, at the bracket home, Annie gets a call from her dad checking in on her because, you know, he loves her. Loves her so much, he's also sent a deputy there to watch over the house, but this dude Deputy Neil is killed pretty quickly by Michael Myers when he comes from behind a tree with a, uh, pipe thing? He kills the cop with the neck snap off screen, but don't worry, we see the result of the kill later on in a close-up. Like Rob Zombie would have a non-graphic kill in this movie. Get on out of here. The vulnerable Annie is now getting ready for bed as, what, Michael's ghost mom watches her? How does that make sense? Maybe it's because Michael's there in the house already. Man, Danielle Harris's Annie doesn't deserve to get brutalized again. She just went through that shit in the last movie. But after she sees Michael standing behind her and tries to run away in slow motion, that's exactly what happens to her. Although surprisingly, it's done off screen in audio only form, her screams playing out over shots of Maya and Lori pulling up to the house. After they get inside and head upstairs, the two of them find the results of Michael's attack and open the bathroom door to discover Annie's very bloody body on the floor. As Lori tends to her dying friend, Maya rushes downstairs to call the police. But after she steps out onto the porch to get the address, Michael yanks her back inside and slams her onto a table so he can kill her. He does so with the usual, a series of vicious 
angry knife stabs to the torso. I'll go ahead and say it, this is the scariest Michael Myers of all time. At the police station, Sheriff Brackett is informed that they just received a call from his house, and unfortunately, it's gonna be too late for him to get back there, because as Lori holds her in her arms and begs her to hang on, Annie dies from the wounds Michael gave her in the attack. This character had a lot of emotional weight in the Rob Zombie films, thanks in large part to Danielle Harris, and her death is one of the best parts of this movie because it's portrayed in such a seriously sad way. Props for that to everyone involved. Michael ruins the moment by slamming his way through one of the bathroom doors, so Lori escapes out another door and manages to make her way outside to kick off, you fucking guessed it, another Halloween chase scene. While she and Michael run off into the light, Sheriff Brackett gets home and finds his daughter's body. It's a sad scene here, but the director's cut version is a lot more raw and powerful. You'll see in the cut comparison. After Lori makes her way out to a road and successfully flags down a dude driving by, he puts her inside his car only to get attacked by Michael and slam through his own windshield. Michael then heave hose the car up onto its side and flips it straight the hell over, goddamn, sending it down into a ditch. And if the driver wasn't dead from all that, he definitely perishes in the ensuing fire. Like, for sure, there's an explosion and everything. But Lori was saved from that fire by Michael, who carries her into a random shack with his ghost mom and ghost younger self. But maybe they're not ghosts? Cause Lori sees them too and is literally talking to them. Who are you? You know who I am, Angel. No, I do not. Their weird conversation gets interrupted by a spotlight from a helicopter, cause the Haddonfield PD is here to bring this movie on home. Throughout all this, Loomis has been a little more self-reflective, rewatching his Nerdist interview and realizing how much of an arse he's been. When he sees on the news that police are currently in a standoff with Michael, he rushes out to be part of the movie's finale. He gets to the shack in record time, only to get decked by Sheriff Brackett for writing about Lori's secret identity. And also, cause, you know, like his daughter just got killed. Loomis admits his wrongdoing and says that he's here to make amends, which he does so by rushing towards the shack like a madman. Looney Loomis is back, bitches! He walks into the shack to find whatever the fuck this is going on, although at least through his eyes we get confirmation that Mini Mike and Dedera are ghosts or whatever, since he can't see either of them. He tells Lori to stop imagining things, like he's trying to get a TV network to stop airing a deadly commercial. STOP IT! STOP! 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 Instead of stop stop stopping though, Michael attacks Loomis and straight up slashes the shit out of him. In fact, this is the end of Michael's ancient keeper. With a whole bunch of stabs, he murders Dr. Loomis once and for all. And murders him fucking good, dude. Is that some brain I see there? Yo, dog, that's some brain right there! Sheriff Brackett sees Michael through his rifle scope and takes the shot. And a few more shots send Michael stumbling back where he falls onto some farm equipment that goes straight through his back and out the front. Take that, slayer of kitty cats, eater of dogs. In the quiet that follows, Lori approaches Michael and tells him he's an asshole. I love you, brother. Wait, what? You love him? And Michael doesn't even care. He's still trying to kill your ass with his last breaths. But he doesn't have the strength to do it, and instead, Lori takes the knife from his hands and returns the favor, stabbing him in the chest a ton of times while yelling, die, 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 like so many horror heroes and heroines do when they're driven to murderous madness. With that, the Rob Zombie Michael Myers is dead. And that's a wrap on Tyler, everybody. Give him a hand. As Brackett watches from the police line, Lori steps out of the shack wearing the Michael Myers mask, which is probably somebody's fetish somewhere. Oh, actually, it's Steve's from the first movie. Come on, babe, I wanna... She kneels to the ground and, in exceedingly slow motion, removes the mask from her head. We get our first instance of the classic John Carpenter Halloween score in this movie as it fades into the final scene, Lori in a whitewashed hallway sitting on a sanitarium bed. The movie ends with her looking up to see Deborah Myers and that white horse coming at her, which causes her face to morph into one of those weird truth or dare smiles. For the tenth time, I ask you rhetorically, how many kills were in this Halloween movie? And for the tenth time, I answer for you, let's find out and get to the numbers. 19 people died in Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, and the victims consisted of 12 men and 7 women. Oh, also, he ate a dog. Ain't no pie wedge for that shit, though. With a runtime of 115 minutes, we wound up with a kill on average just about every 6 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Gary Scott, who got his head sawed off with a piece of glass. I love a good decapitation, and this one is pretty brutal. Dol machete for lamest kill will go to Deputy Andy Neal, who got attacked out of nowhere by Michael and had his neck snapped. Where'd Mike even come from there? And that's it. Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 came out in 2009, and for 9 years it was the final Halloween movie. That just changed with the 2018 Halloween out in theaters now. You can click up there for my in-depth review of it, and it'll join this series after it comes out on Blu-ray. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Dustin Campbell, Scott Beach, and Jerry. Just Jerry. German Jerry. Finally done with the Halloween franchise after I record the cut comparison for this one. No more Michael Myers, fuck you, dude. And then in a few months when I have to do uh, Halloween 2018, which I really liked. All right, be good people or else.